Yeah, that's some good news. Uh, remember we were praying that the property owner would extend the contract for three more months, and this week they agreed to that. So, uh, yeah, we're still in with the... Uh, we're still in with the Tierra Hada property, and uh, the last I heard from uh, some attorneys and uh, some people that are involved in the project, they're saying things are, things are looking pretty good, okay? So we just have to really pray this one through. Again, just, just for those who weren't here last week, the, the issue is we're coming up on a deadline in March where we have to either buy this land or not, uh, according to the owners, and because they've been very, very gracious through this project to kind of keep it in escrow for like two years. And... Uh, and we're saying, gosh, the, the county still hasn't made up their mind, but we think we're getting really close and showed them everything that we're doing. And can you extend it just three more months? And then by June, um, we'll, we'll absolutely make a decision either to buy the property or not. And, uh, and they agree to that. And uh, so everything's still going through with the, the county. Everything is in line, going in process. Uh, truth is, is more probably than not, <laughs> that's not even a phrase, um, probably uh, we're going to buy this thing in June, and we have to be prepared for that. Uh, the property is $5 million, and, uh, but, but we're, looking, we're looking pretty good financially. But if it, if it is a go with the county, then I'll let you guys know, and then uh, we've got to figure out what we're going to do come June and how we're going to take care of this thing. So start saving up. Um, <laughs> Last last weekend, uh, last week, that whole study on being secure in your relationship with God, um, of all the passages in Galatians, I think that one hit me the most, impacted me the most, and I, I hope it impacted your life. I hope it impacted your relationship with God this week to where you feel secure and you're not your whole life striving and trying to earn God's graces and God's favor. I mean, it doesn't even make any sense to earn God's grace when you think about it. Because grace, by defini definition, is, is something given to you that you did not earn. And yet so many people spend their lives trying to grasp this good enough concept to be acceptable in God's sight when everything Scripture teaches is that God loved us while we were sinners, when we were our worst. Everything, when you read and you look at the life of Jesus, that's what he did. He went after the worst of the worst, the people who were down and out. And in the, in the pit of their sin... That's when he loved them and went after them. And so why do we, with insecurity, strive after the love of God? But uh, I, I realized something last Sunday in between services. I was talking to someone about the message, and we were talking about our previous church experiences and some of the things that we, we went through in church. And, and it dawned on me, and I, I realized, you know what? Consciously or subconsciously, some churches quote-unquote Christian churches, actually want you insecure. They want you to be insecure in your relationship with God. They want you to be insecure in your assurance of salvation in heaven because if you're insecure, that guarantees that, that it'll curb your behavior. You'll live in this fear of, oh, I better not do that because I might go to hell. I better not do that or I might go to hell. I better start serving. I better start giving so that I'll go to hell. See, by making you insecure and leaving you in this, I don't know, I don't know if I'm really saved state, it guarantees that you'll at least do something out of fear of not going to heaven. Yeah, you guys, that's not a Christian thing to do. That's what the cults do. They, they, they you know, people go, well, how come people in cults are so much more committed? I go, they're not, they're not more committed. They do these things because they have to. If they don't do them, they're going to go to hell. And so, of course, they're out doing these things because they're out earning their salvation. If they don't do this, they're not going to become a god. So they better go and do this. They better follow these steps. There's these rules. They have to do this because they don't want to go to hell. They, they, you know, they want to become gods or get their 70 virgins or whatever it may be. That, that they're a rich nirvana, you know, whatever it is, they must do these things. They're enslaved by this system where they must do this, must do this, must do this. Otherwise, they're not going to get the desired result. But that's not what Scripture teaches. That's not the way God wants us to live, to be in slavery and bondage to these rules in order to earn something 
But really what the Bible teaches is that there's a God who loves you in spite of your actions. You're not a slave who is only loved when you do what is right. You're a son of God who is loved. Even during those times you might rebel against God, he still loves you because you're his son. And what the scriptures teach is that this kind of grace, this kind of love of God ought to result in action. So it's not a fear that drives you to do these things, but it's this understanding of being secure and loved by God and an understanding of his grace and his kindness that actually leads you to action. I love the passage in Romans chapter 2. Verse 4, when it says, Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward repentance? See, what is it that leads a person to turn away, to turn away from their sins and the things that are rebellious against God? What causes a person to turn from that? and turn toward God, the Bible says it's supposed to be the kindness of God. That God, by loving you in spite of all that, that ought to change your life, that ought to affect you. You should say, wait, God loves me in the midst of all these things? In the midst of everything that I did, God still went after me? That while I was a sinner, He still loved me and went after me? And then once you believe that, you become a son of God, a child of God. And so even at those times when you rebel against God, it's saying that, wow, He still loves you. He's still kind towards you. He's patient. I mean, think about how patient God has been in your life. Think about all the things that He put up with with you. And He says, when you think about that, that that's what should motivate you to turn from the way you're living is the love of God. The security in God ought to change you. You know, I, um, I was praying this morning and I'm just praying for you guys and I was just going, Lord, I just pray that we get this. I pray that we get exactly what the Bible says here where we are so blown away by your kindness and how good you've been to us that we willingly turn our lives around. That it's not me standing up and making you feel insecure that makes you change or fear that makes you change, but that it's the kindness of God that leads you to repentance. I wanted to take this weekend, uh, I'm taking kind of a deviation just this week from the book of Galatians, because I want to make sure we're on the same page. We've talked about a lot of different things over the last few weeks and this security in Jesus. And, um, but I titled the sermon today, Grace and Works. Because I want to make sure we're still on the same page here, that just because we're secure in God, that doesn't mean that we don't do anything. Okay? In fact, what the Bible says is that true grace will actually lead to action. See, because the moment Cornerstone becomes a church that doesn't do anything, that's the moment I leave, you know, and hopefully the moment you leave. If we're just about talk, the moment Cornerstone becomes a church that's known for how well they talk from up front, how well they talk, what a good show they put on, just forget about it. That's a waste of time. We are supposed to be known by our actions. We're supposed to be known by what we do. And if anyone's been a part of the church for even a few months, you know that Cornerstone is all about doing something. See, understand, grace, grace does not negate works, okay? And I've been saying it week after week. I go, okay, it's not about works. It's not about works. It's not about works in the sense of earning our salvation, but I want to make sure you didn't take that in the wrong way and say, well, then we, we don't need to do anything. Okay, the grace and works go together, but it's the grace that ought to motivate our works, not a fear and not a sense of earning. I, I heard a great quote this week. Um, a guy named Dallas Willard writes in his book called The Great Omission. It says this, grace is not void of effort. Grace is absolutely void of earning. 
It's not that grace, because God's shown his grace on us, that that means we don't put any effort into our relationship with God. Okay, I understand that. But grace is absolutely void of any type of earning for yourself. But uh, like I said earlier, if grace does not result in action, then it's not true grace. If you say you understand the grace of God and yet there's no result in your life, your life doesn't show it, then you don't understand the grace of God. The Bible is very clear about that. I know it may seem confusing. I mean, it totally makes sense in my head. Does, does that make sense to you? Okay, so, so there, there are actions involved. In fact, if there are no actions, then you didn't really understand grace. It, it's, it's not a matter of working or not working. It's a matter of the attitude with which you work. Grace is a sense in which I understand what God has done for me, therefore I can't help but serve Him. Versus earning and works, this whole idea of, I don't know if God's going to let me into heaven, I don't know if I'm good enough, and so maybe if I do these good works, I can earn it somehow. See, that is not grace, that is called religion. And that's not what we're a part of. We're a part about this relationship with God where I'm secure in His love, and being so loved by Him, and understanding His kindness. What better thing is there to do with my life than to to live for this God and serve this God. In Jude chapter 3, I'm sorry, there's only one chapter, Jude, verses 3 and 4, it describes this false grace that I'm talking about. It says, Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. See that, that last phrase, he says, you, you see, there's, there's certain men, there's people who have kind of slipped into the church. And what these people are teaching, it says they are godless men. These people who have snuck in, who changed the grace of our God into a license for immorality. See, he explains, even way back then, even 2,000 years ago, there were people that would go into the church, and what they said, they go, hey, we're saved by the grace of God. God has forgiven us freely, so you know what? He's just going to keep on forgiving, so we can just sin. We can do the things that he hates, and you know what? We'll be forgiven. Because that's God's grace. You guys, and the Bible says those are godless men who teach that, that are changing the grace of God, and they're turning it into a license for immorality. That means if you sit here today and you go, you know what? God loves me, so you know what? I can just go on in my sin. The Bible says you're godless. You don't get it. You don't understand the grace of God if you think that just means that you can do whatever you want and God's going to keep forgiving you. That mentality, that mindset of, oh, you know what, I can do this. God will forgive me afterwards. Oh, I can do this. God will forgive me afterwards. That type of mindset comes from a person who's godless, a person who doesn't understand the grace of God. You see this whole idea of uh, it being a... uh, a license for immorality, that the Bible makes it clear that there's no room for that in the church. In fact, the Bible says if anyone in the church calls himself a brother, in 1 Corinthians 5, if you would actually call yourself a brother, a sister, or a Christian, and yet you continue in these actions, the Bible says you need to get that person out of your church. See, that's not a person who understands the grace of God. So are you getting this? It's, you know, absolutely, you are secure in God. But if you're secure, there's going to be a result in your life. It doesn't mean that we just run rampant in this room. And that was one of my fears, um, was, was that the more I talk about the grace of God, grace of God, grace of God, that some of you may misinterpret what I'm saying as though, wow, if we just live in the grace of God, this is going to become this, this room filled with immorality. And yet that's not what the Bible says. And you go, no, if you get it, if you understand how good God is, if you understand his love, his forgiveness, his kindness, that'll lead you to repentance. That'll lead you to change your life. His love will motivate you. On the contrary, you have Titus chapter 2, 
verse 11 and 12, it says this, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. See that? The grace of God actually teaches us to say no to ungodliness. And I love you. See that word uh, teaches? It teaches us. It teaches us. That word teaches there is the, the same root as that word. Remember a couple of weeks ago I described the idea of the tutor, you know, the slave that, that would kind of overlook the, the little kid as he was growing up and he was kind of the master of the little kid. He was the one that disciplined him and everything else. Same root word here. And, and back then we were talking about how the law was the one who disciplines us. And the law was that tutor. Here he's saying the grace of God kind of takes over in a sense and it teaches. The grace of God actually disciplines us, tutors us, and it helps us to say no to ungodliness. And uh, it's interesting because when it says it it teaches us to say no, um, the the word is in a tense in the Greek where it's a once for all completed action. That means at at your conversion, at the moment you understood the grace of God, there's a sense in which you definitively say, you make a decision right then, you know what? I'm done with my old life. That's it. When you understand, when you really understand the grace of God, you make a decision at that moment, I'm done with my old self. I'm done with those things that I was doing. That ungodliness, it's over with. And it's a process of getting those things out, but you made a once and for all decision. And that's why once you make that decision, we say, you know what, come up here and get baptized. Because getting baptized is that whole idea of, I'm done. I'm dying. I'm dying to my old self. And I'm going to rise again to a new life. See, when you understand the grace of God, it leads you to say no to the things that God hates. And then the rest of your life is this working out of that. If you read on in Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Bam. Okay, Titus 2, there you go. While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. You see, the grace of God doesn't lead us to laziness, as some may assume it would. No, when you understand the grace of God, what it says is that, I love that last phrase, um, It makes you eager to do what is good. Don't you want to do what God wants you to do? Aren't you eager for that? Isn't there in you that goes, you know what, I I don't want to just live my life and do what everyone else does. I want to be used by God. Do you guys think that way? Do you you in your mind just go, Lord, I don't want to live an ordinary life. I I want to be totally used by you. I, I want to live such a holy life that it blows people's minds. I want you to change me completely where I live differently. And I want my life to count for something. I'm eager to do good works. I talk to so many of you that get frustrated with life because you go, I know there's more. I just feel like I'm just paying the bills, going to work, doing my deal, blah, blah, blah. And that's not what I was created for. There's more. There's something more. And there's something. In, see, and it's not, it's not this works thing like I better do these things or, or I might not go to heaven. I better accomplish what I need to do or I won't get there or God will be angry at me. It, it's not even about that. It's about this longing. It's about a desire. Just like you want to be holy, you're also eager for good works. Man, I don't know about you, but I want my life to count for something. I, I want to, you know, on my deathbed, you know, if, if I have one, if it's, you know, not a freak accident, but I'm just in the hospital and thinking about it, you know, hey, I'm going to die soon. I want to I wanna be able to look back at my life and go, man, what a ride. I'm ready, God. I feel like I did something with my life. 
I, I really believe that somehow I was co- able to communicate while I was on the earth that you're a great God, and now I'm going to see you any moment. That's the way I want to end my life. You guys, I was talking to a friend of mine this week, and we were in the offices talking, and it was so powerful what she was saying that I said, you know what? Do you mind if I grab the video crew? <laughs> and uh, I want the whole church to hear what you are saying right now. And uh, um, her name is Heather Mercer. You may rem- remember her um, back from 9-11. But uh, we, we ended up videotaping our conversation just so that you guys could get a piece of this because... I felt like it's exactly what I was talking about, about someone that was eager to do what God wanted her to do and wants her to do today. So if you just watch the screens right now. So, Heather, you were telling me about, like, how when you were in college, you prayed certain prayers, and and you had no idea how God was going to answer that. Tell me about that. Yeah, when I was um, in college, showed up at Baylor University in 1995, that was really where God got a hold of my life in a really significant way through a local church community there. And I would hear stories of how God was moving around the world in ways that we read about in Scripture. And uh, it was a time in my life where God was really getting a hold of my heart just in my relationship with Him. I was falling in love with Him. I was experiencing His love for the first time in a real significant way. And I would read the New Testament, and I think, I want my life to look like this. You know, I want to, if this is really going on around the world, I want to be a part of it. And hear stories of how God was healing, um, healing the sick, and masses being saved, and churches being started in a day. And um, I just thought that that sounds like the most exciting thing I could ever be a part of. And so I just started to pray and say, God, you know, I don't know what I have to give you, but if there's something that you can do with my life, then please, I I want to go to the places that nobody else wants. And as a college student. And I think we all go through this in life. I I had this sense of, um, generally, of insecurity. Like, is there anything that God can do with me? Because I don't don't have a lot to offer. I don't have some great talent or skill. But the desire was there to be a part of seeing history change um, through the gospel. How did they they capture you? I I mean, I I forget the story. I mean, that initial moment when... I mean, what were you doing? What, what happened when they came after you? Yeah, when we were taken, we'd been uh, basically investing in a few Afghan families, mostly widows and orphans that lived in Kabul, um, people that were involved in some of the projects that we were doing with food distribution, things like that. And this one family had uh, really shown an interest in the gospel. And if you can imagine... <coughs> living in a time that looked very much like the time of Jesus and experiencing a regime that had taken everything away. And these people were desperate in the true sense of the word. So to hear about a God of love who could give them hope in the midst of what they were going through um, gave them, they were very responsive. So we were sharing with this Afghan family, and on the day we were arrested, we had gone and shown the Jesus film to them, and what we didn't know was that the Taliban had actually targeted them, 
and infiltrated the family with um, a Taliban spy. And when we went to show the Jesus film, the Taliban left and got the religious police, and they came back and arrested us. Wow. And you were detained how long? It was three and a half months. Three and a half months. So when you come back, I mean, I just remember, <coughs> like it was yesterday, I mean, just the news, everything else. I mean, you became, I mean, really like a national hero to a lot of people, and you end up sharing your story, mm -hmm. and you share it for a couple years, mm -hmm. and then what did God start doing in your life? Yeah, I mean, both Dana and I really felt like, you know, there was a season to share the story, but uh, we came to a point where we realized we don't want to keep sharing the same story. And, you know, God's always, he's, he's a living testimony. He invites us into the miracles of what he's doing in his kingdom day by day. And so, you know, I just said, God, I want to be involved in the next miracle. I mean, this, you didn't save me for this to be the end of the story. And, um, so I just started praying and saying, God, where's the next place? And uh, thought he might send me back to Afghanistan. And I hope at some point I get to go back there. Um, but when the war in Iraq started, he opened up <laughs> that door to go back into Iraq and uh, to serve uh, him among the Kurds. So That is so cool. I love that part about your story of just... <laughs> I don't want to spend the rest of my life talking about this one thing that God did, as huge as it was. I mean, most people would look at that and say, okay, that's my legacy. I've lived my life. I've done what I need to do for the kingdom. And for you to go, no, there's like a rush in being at the center of, of what God's doing in the world, even if it's painful, even if it's difficult, and, and you just want to stay in that. Like, you don't want to get comfortable. You don't want to just, you know, sell your books and sign them and... You know, that, that was actually my biggest fear, yeah, yeah. was that that would be the end of it. Yeah. And um, I, you, you taste what God's doing, and you taste who he is, and nothing else is better. Is it, is it hard being back in the U.S. in a somewhat comfortable setting? It can be. You know, it's, I, I feel the subtlety yeah. of how uh, the comfort of this age really can creep in. Um, so, you know, it, it can be a temptation. So um, I find that the gospel is a lot simpler overseas a lot of times. But I, I have a real passion to see people get a vision for what God's doing around the world and engage in it in a really meaningful, life-changing, world-changing way. And so as long as God has me in the States, that's the trumpet I'm going to blow and see how many people I can take with me. Wow. Now, you know, when we were talking earlier, I was thinking, oh, I wish you had come last night and had you speak to the whole church. But if you had an opportunity to talk to uh, the people at Cornerstone mm -hmm. and, and just, like, what, what word of encouragement would you want to say? I mean, if there's one thing you could say to all these people living here, we're in Southern California, it's a great <laughs> place to live and everything else. Mm -hmm. But what, what would be the one message God's put on your heart to share with maybe the college students or, or really for anyone? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And I might, maybe I can say two things. Um, and the first thing would be um, the reality that when we learn God is with us, then there's no place that we can't go and there's nothing that we can't do. Um, in captivity, I think that was the lesson he really drove home to me is his promise is true. Lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. I will be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And when that reality became a part of the very core of my being, um, then whatever the question is, it's easy to say yes. And there's so much freedom when we really, really, really know that God is with us. Then there's nothing to be afraid of. So um, that would be the first thing. And then I think the second thing would be um, that God, I, <coughs> I would say the second thing is that God is really challenging um, from what I'm, I'm seeing the American church to rise up out of the status quo and really apprehend the life of a New Testament disciple. And it's costly, you know, and I think we, um, we're sometimes afraid of that. Um, but once we've lost everything, and we realize we have nothing left to lose. We find out in the end we've gotten it all back. 
because everything we want is found in Jesus anyway. And I would, you know, uh, just really plead and call out to the American church to um, apprehend what um, it's like to lose your life because there's so much freedom to be found in that. cool my favorite part of the interview was when she says yeah that was my biggest fear was that that's all God would have for my life and that would be the end of it she goes because it was so good she said I wouldn't trade that experience I mean imagine being held captive by the Taliban as a single gal for three and a half months every day she just thought this is it I'm dead. They're going to kill me today. And she was just praying, going, God, I thought I would minister to him my whole life. Um, but she, she talked about how as great as that was, and she would not trade it for anything. In fact, she refers to that experience as the grace of God. Think about that. She says, that's the grace of God. Because God has shown me his grace in allowing me to experience that. And she said, in those days in that cell by myself, I felt the presence of God. I was close to him like never before. And my biggest fear now is that I won't get that back. And my biggest fear is I'm going to spend the rest of my life just traveling around and having this comfortable lifestyle. So I need to go back. God has more that he wants to do. I don't want just that to be my legacy. I'm thinking, just that? You know, and her part, the, the, the partner in ministry, uh, Dane, Dana Curry, um, she's in Morocco now, you know, in, in northern Africa, just, again, ministering to Muslim people because it's just this rush. It's this idea of what that verse was saying. I, I didn't think I could explain it any better than that. Of When you understand the grace of God, you're eager to do good works. See, some of you in this room, you've experienced the presence of God when you were put in situations that were terrifying, possibly. When you're in situations where you didn't know what was coming next, but in that time, you were so close to God. And while there's a sense in which you don't want to go back and have to relive some of those difficult times, there's also the side of, man, but I was so close to God that I wouldn't trade it for anything. And I actually long for that intimacy with God. See, when you watch this video, I, I guess the question that comes to my mind is, do you watch that and think to yourself, well, that's her. God's not going to do anything great in my life at this point. See, my fear was that some people would watch that video and go, well, that's her. And she's a hero. Good for her. But me, I'm, I'm a mom. Or I'm a dad or I'm a businessman. Or I struggle with, with my anger, or I'm an alcoholic, or I'm, I'm this, I'm that, or I'm old, I'm too young, I'm too stupid, whatever, you know? That's, I, I, just, I just fear, we, we just go, well, that's them, and I am destined for a life of mediocrity where I make no difference on the earth. And so I'll just kind of try to live quietly. And that's what I loved. Is she says, you know, what? she goes, it wasn't until I was in that cell for like a couple months that I realized this is what I prayed for when I was in college. She prayed in college. She says, I, I pray that, God, you would put me where no one else wants to go. <laughs> I think you're there, Heather, you know. Uh, she goes, put me where, where I'm talking to people that no one else talks to and no one wants to talk to. Yeah, no one really wants to talk to Taliban guards in a prison cell. And she goes, wow, this is what I prayed for. And she says, it just hit me. And she goes, I thank God again by your grace. You let me. She cried on her way to Afghanistan the first time. Like, God, I can't believe you're letting me go. She cried when she's in that cell, going, God, I can't believe you answered my prayer. She cries when she's released. No way. You're not, you're not having me die yet. There's still a life of service. And now just to see her joy and eager to do more. But I just hope you don't look at that and go, well, that's her. 
See, because I, I made some statements uh, over the last few weeks, last weekend, um, kind of jokingly, kind of not, um, about my relationship with God. And I talked about how there are times when I just feel like I'm the only person on this earth. Like, He loves me so much, and there's no way He loves me like, or He loves you like He loves me, because there's this intimacy. And I said that somewhat jokingly, not because it's not how I feel, but I know that God loves us all equally. In fact, I've had some individuals say, it's so good to hear what you said about your relationship with God, because they go, you know what, that's the way I've always felt. I felt like he loves me like no one on the earth. So it's good to hear someone else say that, that that's the way you feel also. But the other comment I got from some people, or there were people that came up and said, yeah, you know, I really do think he loves you like no one else. You know? Because <laughs> I had people say, you know, they, God doesn't answer my prayers like he answers yours. He doesn't listen to me like he listens to you. And, man, if that's really what you think, that, that God is a father who plays these favorites, and so he'll listen to one more than the other, man, it's going to take you down a road of mediocrity that you don't want to go down. You know what one of my favorite verses in the Bible is? It's in James 5, and it says, Elijah was a man just like us. That has been one of my life verses. I love that verse. See, because we can look at people in the Bible like Elijah that did all these miracles, calling down fire from heaven, and you go, man, Elijah, and we lift him up as this great saint. Or Moses, man, parting the Red Sea, you know, leading the people, you know, through the desert and everything. Wow, Moses, wow, Joshua. We can look in the Bible at all of these great men and women of God. Wow, Paul, you know, who wrote the book of Galatians. Peter, you know, God used to start the church. All of these people, let's lift them up to be saints. These are these great, amazing people. But no, what Scripture says is, Elisha was a man. Just like us. And he prayed earnestly. See, when I read that verse, I go, Elijah has nothing on me. David, Moses, Paul, they're people. Just like me. And so when I pray, I, I, I try to have this faith where I go, God, this is no different than Moses on that mountain. He, he's, not, he's not more special than I am. He was a man just like me. And when I watch a video like that and I see the life of Heather Mercer, and I don't know what God's going to do as she heads back to Iraq and is gathering all these people, and she's got all these people going there, and they're starting this whole center to reach the curse. It's amazing the doors that God's open. But I go, God, okay, okay. Use me now. Do something with me. You're no different from, than me. David's no different than me. Apostle Paul, he's no different than me. I, I read what these guys did and changed the world, so, so you could do that through me. Because the point of that passage is he was a man just like us, and yet he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it didn't rain on the land for three and a half years. Then he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. This guy was so, so fervent in his prayer life that he said, God, I, I don't want it to rain. We, 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 I, don't, I, want it, I don't want it to rain. And so for three and a half years, it didn't rain. The point of the story is he was a man just like us. These great women of the Bible, Deborah, this woman just like some of you, you know? And Heather, just a woman another person just a college girl that was feeling insecure like god are you going to do anything through me but she prayed you know god do something through me is that your prayer or have you given in to a life of mediocrity see the grace of god doesn't the grace of god motivate you where you go i want to do something great with my life that's what it ought to do Make it eager for good works. Self-discipline, running away from sin. 
leading you to repentance and living a life that's worth living. My prayer for us this weekend as a church is that for those of you who just kind of walked in and you just assume, I'm just going to go to a church service and listen to a few things and maybe walk away a little closer to God. That would go so far beyond that. But today you would understand what a great God you have who loves you, who is crazy about you, and hears your prayers. That today, whether you're an insecure college student going, oh, God, can God do anything with my life? Or if you're 90 something years old in this room and going, is there anything left? That you remember uh, this Bible is just filled with men and women. Abraham was a hundred, so you got him beat. You know, when God says, this is, this is when I'm really going to use you. It's just this idea of God taking ordinary people who believe in a God that could do miracles through them. Do you believe that about your life? Because that's what the grace of God ought to lead you to. Because if you believe the grace of God, if you believe God Almighty sent His Son, if you believe that, that he did that for you, why would he withhold any good thing? See, because when you really believe, it's going to change your life. If you really believe that God had his son die for you specifically, and he loves you as an individual, how can you not believe that he wants to use your life for great things? I want to give you, again, just some time right now, because I believe this is an intimate moment between you and God, where you personally, don't pray for the rest of the church. Don't pray for everyone else. Pray for yourself. If you are eager for good works and eager for your life to count for something on this earth, if that's your desire, then right now, I'm just going to have you guys bow your heads. And close your eyes and ask God, regardless of what state of life you're in right now, to ask Him to do something with your life. Believe that He hears you from heaven. And ask Him to make something great of your life. And if you guys need prayer, if you want to get baptized, have any questions, I'll be up by the prayer room with some of the other, other pastors.